Hope to Timothy, and uh, we are in the sixth chapter, which is the last chapter in the letter to First Timothy, or the first letter to Timothy. Uh, and it holds a lot of wisdom, a lot of concern, a lot of advice that uh, uh, Paul gives to Timothy. <clears throat> and we've been walking through this letter, trying to look at lessons that are available to us and uh, the advice that was given to Timothy and lots of great things that we can appropriate and make our own. Uh, and certainly we can learn about We can learn about the organization of the church, the qualification of elders and deacons. We've discussed widows. We've discussed uh, false teachers. And that's what we're going to finish up. So you can imagine if you've written a letter, and all of us have written letters over the years, you know that, okay, that last paragraph, what do I want to write? What good things or most important things do I want to write about? that will carry the message that I'm trying to get through. And that's, that's where Paul is right now. He's wrapping things up. He's highlighting the most important. And so that's what we're going to look at. So chapter 6, and we'll start with a pop quiz. Now, I, I wish I'd have brought some Halloween candy, but I didn't bring any Halloween. Oh, well, there you go. So if you get this... We've got a gentleman in the back with some lifesavers that uh, will give you a little present for getting this. So the pop quiz is this. How does Paul define a real widow? Do you remember that from last week? I'm sorry? Without family. Without family. What else? Over 60. Over 60. Faithful. Oh, you guys are great. Means I did a great job last week, didn't I? <laughs> or you spent time in the Word and, and read the read the chapter. So in chapter five, verses three through five, we find that uh, uh, Paul clarifies this idea: of what is a widow? What is a widow indeed? And so he he clarifies that. He says, "Look, there are people with no family. They're they're widows that are left all alone." They are, have they have set their hope on God and continues in supplications and prayers. So that's the, uh, the clarification that uh, Paul gives to Timothy about the widows. And there must have been a, a fair amount of widows there in the church in Ephesus for Paul to take time to address and discuss their needs and the care of widows. So this morning we're going to look at chapter 6. And we'll start with a couple of verses on, on being a slave and how to behave as a slave. And then he goes into a discussion of uh, false doctrine, false teachers. And then he takes time to make a final charge and give guidance to Timothy about how to uh, proceed. And then finally he finishes up the chapter with the uh, problems of wealth and intellectualism. And so we'll look at those items this morning. All right, uh, so we'll start out with the first two verses. And it's, it's kind of interesting. I mean, they, he hasn't really talked about slaves uh, yet in this book. But here he's going to talk about it for just a second. Now, as always, you have to ask the question, why? Why is he writing this? And so most likely there were slaves, there were members of the church, there might have been masters of the slaves in this congregation, and there must have been some tension or some misunderstanding about what that relationship, what that behavior should be between the two. So let's read this, starting in verse 1. Let all who are under a yoke of bond, as bondservants regard their own masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. Those who are believing masters must not be disrespectful on the ground that they are brothers. Rather, they must serve all the better, since those who benefit by their good service are believers and beloved. Now, how many types of masters do you see in this passage? Two? Ah, okay. So those that are Christian, those that are not. Uh, 
I would say there's a, a subcategory. In other words, the slaves all have a master, right? right? It's just that some masters are believers. And so that changes that relationship. Dennis? It also talks about their own masters as opposed to somebody else's master. Right, right, yeah. And so let's look at some lessons out of this. Uh, by the way, is there slavery in the world today? Yes. Now, there are 94 countries in the world that it's not a criminal item or felony or event to have a slave, to own a slave. 94 countries in the world. Now, all countries say, no, we disapprove of slavery. But there are many countries, especially in the Far East, in Africa, where slavery is still happening today. And so you can imagine a missionary going into an area and uh, saying, well, slavery is wrong. Ooh, okay, well, now you're disrupting the whole situation there. Uh, and a lot of people will be turned off. By the way, does the Bible anywhere say anything against slavery? No. No. Nope. As a matter of fact, in the Old Testament, it says, look, if you fall into debt to somebody, you become their slave. Now, what it does is it really sets a, uh, gives guidance about what this relationship should be, this treatment should be. So it, it's an interesting thing to examine there. Can you imagine for just a moment if Paul had traveled the Roman Empire saying slavery is wrong? Now, it's estimated that two-thirds of all the Roman citizens, or the Romans, uh, the, uh, the people that were in the Roman Empire, were slaves. So can you imagine the, the uproar that that would have created if he had gone around teaching that? So instead, he's, he gives guidance on how to get along, and there's a purpose for that. So, what is Paul's primary concern with the behavior of slaves? That they show respect, okay. Uh, and I, Lorraine, I'm sorry, I missed you. Did you? No, I was just, you were saying in the world today, there's slaves all over the U.S. today also. Okay, yeah. Because we have to CMEs on it every year. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah that's interesting. But the, I, I think the, the primary thing he's concerned about is if they are believers, that their, their behavior, uh, if it's, they don't, he doesn't want their behavior to take away from God and God's message. There you go. That, that's the real key right here is, uh, look, if you're a slave, then treat your master with honor and respect and serve him well. If he's not a believer. If, he, if he's a believer, then treat him with respect and good service all the more because he is a brother. And that'll keep that relationship solid. But the primary purpose is just as Mike says, respect and good service so that the gospel, that God and the gospel message not be damaged or harmed. So you, you can imagine as a slave stepping up and telling your master, hey look, we're on equal basis here. You know, we're both brothers in Christ and so this is the way it's gonna happen around here. How would a master take to that? I mean, not very good, not very well, especially when with other slaves around watching this relationship and this action. So, mine? Yeah, Christians are called to be slaves to righteousness. Right. Yeah, are, are we not all slaves in here? Yes. Sure. Yeah, we're slaves, slaves on a different sin, level. Slaves to God. Right, right. So, very interesting to, that Paul takes time, just a couple of verses, just a little passage in here to give guidance for Timothy to understand and teach this relationship between slaves and masters. Okay, let's move on. Uh, I'm going to have to read three or ten verses or three chapter verses three through ten, so seven verses here, and here he's going to talk about false teachers. So let's begin. Teach and urge these things. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of the Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. 
He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. So let's take a few minutes to talk about these seven verses here. and Look at what Paul is, uh, is messaging Timothy about. He emphasizes, teach and he urge these things. So listen up. He gets back to the false teachers. Now this is, again... A time where Paul emphasizes, look, look for these false teachers. They're they're out there. They're they're within you. And if anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words, it's an interesting word. The sound, you know, when when you're looking for a preacher, uh, what is the one of the qualifications that you that you list? Follow the word of God. Yeah, they have to be sound in the word, right? They have to be sound in doctrine. What does that mean, sound? Not, not, not. Truth. Truth. Truthful. Okay, not, Dennis. Okay. They're not deviating from what's, what the Bible says. Yeah, yeah. So they're abiding, they're staying within the scriptural doctrine that uh, we all understand and is truthful. So that is a sound. It's interesting, the Greek uses a word that means healthy. They have a healthy position. They have a healthy doctrine. So that's, a, that's an interesting use. So sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness. Uh, and some were, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. You know anybody conceited? <laughs> I've met a few people that way. I've flown with pilots around the world that, oh man, this guy thinks a lot of himself. You know, the ego is a big thing with pilots. And, uh, so, pretty conceited there. But the, think about that, uh, understands nothing. That, that's pretty, pretty harsh words there. But it's the fact that here is a, an individual who is teaching false doctrine. He is denying Christ and the, the, the gospel of Christ and the salvation that he brought. He's denying that, and that's where the false teaching comes in. Uh, the false teaching is also this idea that we've already discussed about Gnosticism, this idea that Look, I, I see you've got a little bit of an understanding, but let me explain to you that to really be a good Christian, you need to know these things that only I know. And once you understand these things, and you may never understand these things like I understand these things, but this is necessary for you to be a solid Christian. And once I go down that path of there's, there's knowledge that you can really never have, but I'll, I'll try and help you along. Uh, that, that's false doctrine there because we have everything we need in the scriptures. But uh, he also, these individuals, these false teachers have an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. I know that no one in here has ever associated with anybody described by these words. <laughs> if you have, you can probably remember their name. <laughs> I find it interesting that, that he 
worded that as a craving. And you, know, you see so much of that, seemingly, it's, it's becoming more and more prevalent, of course, with social media and, and, and the, the, the way people can make comments without being held accountable. This is, seems to be becoming more and more uh, prevalent. Yeah, and, and we've all dealt with people who love to nitpick, love to argue about little things, meaningless things, uh, and, and that's not sound. Somebody said that if you find a church that is always in turmoil, always discussing, always arguing, nothing's happening because there, there, there's a tension there. There's a lot of energy that is being placed in working out these silly little arguments uh, that in the end mean nothing. But there are people who thrive on that. So you really have to watch for that. Nona? Um, in my version, it says at the end of verse five, from such withdraw yourself. From, so, from it such? It says from such withdraw Yourself yes. from these kind of people. I yeah. Just, I just said that. I was just wondering why. Yeah, I, this is the English Standard Version here. And that's the New King James? No, it's just the Old King James. Okay. All right. So it's, it's yeah. yourself from these kind of people. I don't know. I'll have to look that up. But uh, is that good advice? If possible. If possible, yeah. <laughs> you should just say, okay, thanks. I appreciate your advice on that. And let me move on here. To, to real important things. So that's the advice there. And, and some apparently of these false teachers were viewing this these issues of godliness as a means of gain, possibly uh, power, influence, uh, maybe financial gain. We don't, we're, that's a little unclear, but they viewed it as a, as a means of gain. So then Paul switches gear a little bit and says, but, but godliness, with contentment is great gain. Think in your mind of who who do you know that is truly content? And if you if you can come up with a, a picture in your mind, those are pleasant people to be around. Yeah, an apostle that said it. I've learned to be content in all things. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, and that's some pretty harsh uh, times that he went through, didn't he? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, an apostle said that. I learned to be content in all situations. So uh, very important advice there and perspective. Look, if you can find contentment and righteousness together, that is great gain. And then he says what uh, we all know. We all know that we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. There's no uh, trailers behind hearses, and uh, there's no, uh, I mean, I guess there's people who've been buried in their Cadillacs and yeah. all kinds of funny yeah. stories like that, uh, but uh, they, they will never get use out of those things. So it's, it's interesting that he, he gives that perspective and says, look, you need to find godliness and find contentment, because that's uh, that is great gain. But if we have food and clothing with these we will be content. Now it's uh, it's clear to all of us, and if it's not clear to you, come see me afterwards, and I'll show you pictures of what poverty looks like. If you travel the world, you've seen whole cities. I, I can just distinctly visualize Mumbai, Bombay, old Bombay in India, and flying over the city of Mumbai to land at the airport and just slums, 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 abject poverty. And that's that's where you, you really have to worry about, uh, you know, those people worry about where, what am I gonna eat today? How many of us worry about what we're gonna eat today? Don't raise your hand, you'll, you'll embarrass yourself. <laughs> So, yeah, we don't have the, that kind of concern. We are an extremely wealthy nation compared to the rest. And uh, so it's this idea, look, if your perspective is I have food and I have clothing, you should be content. 
really that's that's a good perspective to have. Moving on, but those who desire to be rich and actually seek it out, seek out to be rich, fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. And we, we're all familiar with the, the uber wealthy, the super wealthy of the country. But we also, I've worked with people who their driving desire every day was to maximize every investment they've made, maximize every penny, uh, always examining that angle, every angle to try and maximize their, uh, their wealth. And then Paul gives this, uh, we've all heard this, right? Money is the root of all evil. Have you heard that? Yeah. And is that misquoted? Yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah, It's the love of money. And again, we've all worked with people, you, I, I'm assuming, uh, who are driven by the love of money. And uh, they, uh, they have a very difficult perspective on this idea. So the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving, this craving for money, that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Pretty powerful words there that, that give us perspective. Surely. We also see in today's society people lust after other people's money. And they have a sense of everything should be fair and equal. <clears throat> Yeah, there's, uh, there's, you know, social justice is, is out there, and it certainly has some good points to it, but uh, the basic principle of I don't work and I don't have any income, I see you have lots of income, regardless of how you got it, or, uh, you know, and you should be giving me some because I'm, I'm a likable person. So... Uh, Anyway, that's, uh, that's it. So uh, to summarize here, the pride of false teachers, this passage, the characteristics of false teachers, they are conceited, interested in controversial disputes about words, producing nothing good, and they see godliness as a means of gain. Uh, godliness and contentment, you can't take it with you. So you, we all need to realize that and, and uh, sober up to that idea. Chris, uh, you can't take all your wealth with you. Sorry. You know, I know that's, you can't take that uh, Dolphins jersey with you. Well, I guess you could. They have those. Take half of those, okay. <laughs> so you can't take it with you. Just a reminder that everybody knows that. You can't take it with you. And the love of money and evil, uh, by the way, is it wrong to be wealthy? No. no. Why not? Abraham would have been wrong. Oh, and who else? Job. Solomon. Solomon. Job. David. Solomon. David. How about in the New Testament? Can you think of a lady that was pretty wealthy? Lydia. 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 And so, and, and we find others. Uh, we find uh, Barnabas. He was a big giver. Dorcas. Cornelius. Lydia. Jason. Aquila and Priscilla. Uh, Philemon. So, you know, all these were, were pretty wealthy people for that time. Obviously, related to us in our country today, uh, they wouldn't have much, or maybe they would have a lot. I don't know. But, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's certainly not wrong to be wealthy. It's what you do with it or don't do with it. Possibly Matthew. Yeah, yeah. Lorraine? I was just saying, it's what you do with it or you don't do with it. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And what is the biggest challenge for wealthy Christians? Not big giving to God. Not we're, we're not well known for being big givers now. Patty? Okay, Mike? Relying on your money to live on God. Yes, that is the problem. Um, I don't know if you have investments. 
But if you have had investments a year ago, they're not nearly worth what they were a year ago. Uh, so there is an instability and uncertainty associated with money that even though we like to ignore and just kind of, well, you know, it'll get better or whatever, but tomorrow we could wake up and seriously, all of it be gone. There's fear. That's fear. That's that's fear. And it's trying to chat to channel that into faith is a difficult thing. Fear to faith. Fear to faith. Yeah, that's a that's a bridge that sometimes is uh, uh, is difficult to walk back and forth and, and see where we are. And Ed, and then Mike. Uh, we have an example with Paul when he talked about contentment. He said he learned to be content in what? Much and little. So if you got little, you can still be content. Sure, sure, sure. Mike? There's, there's many scriptures that, that caution us not to put our faith in, in, in things that thieves can break in and steal and, and moths can eat, but in, in something that's everlasting, and that's God. Right. That's, that's exactly right. Many yeah. examples of that. Yeah. And uh, now, again, is it wrong to plan and, and have money for later on down the road or for whatever project? No, it's not wrong. It's just what's in your heart. What is the attitude that you have towards that money? Are you, God, I got this. I got all this money. You know, I'm self-reliant. I've got it under control. And, and that's kind of the thing that uh, I see with both wealthy people and intellectual people. I got things figured out. I'm a smart guy. God, yeah, okay, I see you out there. But, Nona? Well, most of the very wealthy people that you and I know, all they want to take constant spend every day. Got to buy, got to buy, got to buy, got to spend, but can't get enough material possession. Yeah, the accumulation of things. Yeah. Oh, no, I think the wealthy are going to hang on to it. That's why they're wealthy. Oh, <laughs> uh, they spend a lot of money. Yeah. Not necessarily. All right, let's, let's move on here. Now, here Paul switches gears again and says, But as for you, O man of God, and the Greek includes this word, O. <laughs> Interestingly, he, he clarifies it. He turns it directly, he turns his attention directly towards Timothy and says, But for you, you, Timothy, O man of God, flee these things. What things? Conceit. Conceit. This pursuit of wealth. This wrongful pursuit of wealth using uh, false doctrine, false teachings. And uh, so he says, Don't do those things, but you. Flee these things. That means run away from those things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Does that apply to us? Yes. Say yes. Yes. We should all flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness, and fight the good fight of the faith. The, the word here is not so much a, a war type, but as a struggle, kind of a wrestling match. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. And I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession. Now I'm going to just continue on here. Uh, but I do want you to focus on these action items, right? Okay. Paul gives these action verbs to him. You be sure to flee. You, I want you to pursue. I want you to fight. I want you to take hold. I want, And I charge you. Those are action words right there that he pushes towards Timothy. And he encourages them to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I'll, I'll touch on the rest here in just a moment here. But uh, I, I read those words and I, 
I think about what Paul might have been hoping for Timothy as, uh, as he was working with the church in Ephesus, taking care of the church, guiding the church, fighting false doctrine, and he gives them these really strong action words to encourage them and give them direction. Flee, pursue, fight, take hold, and I charge you in the presence of God, uh, who gives life to all things, to keep the commandment unstained, and I think by commandment, he, he looks back and includes all these things he's been talking about. Fight the, the false doctrine. Don't be greedy for money. Uh, treat the widows right. Uh, sl teach the slaves. All these things. Keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he, he goes into, and we've talked about this before, how Paul... I think, in my opinion, just kind of, his heart just fills to burst. And he writes down these things. Uh, Lord Jesus Christ, and then verse 15, which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. <laughs> Those are just, um, again, an amazing description that Paul lays down in words and describing all this. It's just a, a terrific uh, series of words. And then in the... So let's see here. Marks of spirituality. How does Paul describe the marks of spirituality? Okay, I've given you a lot of action words. The marks of spirituality. How about fleeing the love of money and preaching for gain? Flee that. Stay away from that. Run away from it. Pursue righteousness, faith, and love. And I hope that all of us take time every day to do, to focus on these things, to think about these things. Pursuing righteousness, faith, and love. How do we do that? How do you do that? You've got to study to understand? Yes. What else? Pray. Apply it. Pray? What else? Apply it? What else? Pray with others that uh, have those same values. Fellowship with others that that believe in these things. What else? Oh, great, great thoughts there. But uh, whatever method you approach, I, you know, we, we encourage each other to be disciplined in pursuing this faithful, uh, righteousness, faith, and love. And then stay in the fight. I've seen people fall away. I've seen people give up on the fight. Say, I'm tired of the fight. I'm going to go back to my old life. So that, that happens. And he encourages stay in the fight and take hold of eternal life and keep the commandment that we've talked about. So continuing on, now he kind of backs up, backtracks a little bit and talks about the rich again. As for the rich, in verse 17, in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of what is truly life. So here another piece of advice for the wealthy, for the rich that are in the congregation there. He tells them, don't be haughty. And uh, watch, watch what you're doing there. Don't be haughty. Don't set your hopes on the uncertainty of riches. Uh, but on God, who provides us with everything to enjoy. Now, it, is it wrong for us to enjoy the good things that we have? <laughs> No, it's not. Absolutely nothing was wrong wrong with that. Uh, Mike's got a nice little sailboat. 
why should he not enjoy it? It's his, and God gave it to him. Well, you got a big shape. Well, uh, <laughs> uh, you enjoy it. I I enjoy it. You know, so these are these are good things. And he enjoys it. Ralph and yeah, we got a lot of boaters in here. But it, the important thing is, whatever you have, enjoy what you have. Be content with what you have. And know that it all came from God. And know that it all came from God and belongs to God. That's right. So be generous, ready to share, and store up treasure for yourself up in heaven. So here's the summary thoughts that I have. We are to keep a watchful eye on our attitude towards money and its uncertainty and always rely on God. God will always be there regardless whether our 401k is going up or going down. God will be there for us. And if it drops to zero, that's okay. You know? Ed, has yours dropped to zero? Oh, no, I'm sorry. But, but there's a statement about what you just said that we had on our refrigerator as I was growing up. And it statement said, don't worry about tomorrow. God is already there. <laughs> yeah, that's a good statement, yeah. And then we are not to let it affect our love and care for others. That's an important thing there. We are to use our assets for good and be generous, and these will create treasure in heaven. And if there's a, a good place to have treasure, it's in heaven. Yeah. Everything else, rust, moth, it'll all fade away. And when we are laid in our graves, it, it won't matter. It'll all be gone. Okay. He finishes up with these two uh, verses, verses 20 and 21. And this wraps up this, this great letter that uh, Paul writes to Timothy. Now he'll follow it up with a second letter. And the tone in the second letter is going to be considerably different. Because Paul knows that his time is very short. He is facing death in Rome. And so he, he changes his tone a little bit. He still focuses on some very important things. Especially Paul's teachers. So those, are, those items are still there. So here he says to Timothy, Oh, Timothy. Guard the deposit entrusted to you. What deposit? Those Christians that And the gospel. And the gospel, right? So, do we all have a deposit? Yes, we do. We all are asked to guard the deposit that has been entrusted to us. Avoid the irreverent babble, contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. Again, this, this idea. Uh, I know, you know, what it takes to really be a good Christian. Let me show you over here, because you'll never get this out of the, you'll never understand the inner meanings of the, of the Bible. So let me explain it to you, or try to explain it to you. It's a special knowledge that he's talking about. For by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. And sure enough, these false, false teachers, and he ends up the book with this idea. Hold to the truth. Don't let these false teachers swerve and, and take others with them to damnation. That's ultimately the case. So he again emphasizes that and he finishes up with the words, grace be with you. I, I just have to think about the love that Paul had for Timothy as a son, as a spiritual son that he spent many years with teaching and encouraging and guiding and now he's got them working in Ephesus and trying to reach out to them and say, look, I'm over here in Macedonia. I can't really give you, I can't come down right now. I plan on it. But here's some very important thoughts that I want you to consider. So he sends this letter on with all these thoughts. And aren't we blessed to be able to read these words and consider them for us in our lives? Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.